Okay, so first off, yes, I'm aware exercise 2.2 has issues. Something in cosmic rays, atmospheric, something I've done heinous in a past life, whatever. Every quiz I tried to do on black on a canvas screwed up yesterday. So I'm aware it's there. I will fix it. I'm not as worried about you guys as I am the other class in terms of that particular quiz, so it'll be there. What I'm going to do is just delete it. I'll either combine those questions with another exercise, or I'll just reconstitute this after I find what's wrong with it, repost it for you. If you already took it, um, I'll carry the grade for it if you're happy with it. <laughs> I think one thing you need to know, if you if you end up in the circumstances I'm understanding is you'll go in, you'll look, it'll say you can see the quiz, you open it, zero questions, zero answers, that sort of thing. When we've seen that in the past, I don't know how we get there. The explanations for how it gets there don't work in this case. But the way you can get rid of it is to try clearing your cache out in your browser. Didn't that work for you? Okay. So try that. If it doesn't work, let me, you know, in the future, I'm hoping, you know, I'll take care of this one, but I'm hoping in the future that we don't have it. If it does, try that. So, But I will, you'll see that one go away. I'll record the grade if you're happy with it. <laughs> Actually, I'll record the grades, and you can go back in and do it again if you like. Um, so what we're going to do now, we are starting... That's right. Okay. So we're going to start in on Module 2. Module 1, as I mentioned a bunch of times, is just to kind of give you an overview of what we're doing, get some key concepts and nomenclature out there. It's not, it wasn't anything specific. It was just kind of give you a view of this world and get your mind going that way when you walk through the door. Um, of all those three key things that we said voice systems have to do. Probably the one that's least familiar to you guys is switching. Transmission, I mean, it's a little fancier, but basically it's a file transfer. It does some neat tricks, but that's all it is, really. You know, we're moving data from here to here over a path that's already been established. Okay, you've done that. Signaling, as important as it is, in fact, it's probably the biggest piece that we'll look at volume-wise throughout this whole semester. You've done signaling. It's a protocol that updates the status of things across a network. You've seen that. You've, you've done VLAN databases. You've done routing tables. It's the same idea. So it's, you know, it's not exactly the same thing, but it's in the realm of something you've done. Switching, the way we use the term in here, is foreign to you. You're used to Ethernet switching. Not what we're talking about. We will use it. In fact, our most commonly deployed network for voice over IP is switched Ethernet. Yes, we'll use it, but that's not what we're talking about when we're talking about switching. We're talking about switching voice paths. Okay, so that's why we use the term. So I'm going to spend uh, the first piece here talking about that. We really can't do anything functional with the system until you understand how this works. So we're going to do a lot of practice on this for a little bit. Okay, you saw this slide before. Um, when we talk about circuit switching, you know, we've mentioned this, this is stitching together that single path between endpoints. That's great. If we talk about packet switching, it's about how do packets of data traverse a network between endpoints? Both of those get at part of what we mean when we say switching. They are both defining ways that we specify or stitch together or physically constitute, however you want to think about it, a path for that data to move. And that is a part of switching, but it's only part. Okay? And what the piece that this doesn't get at is what confuses people, okay? Particularly when we start looking at IP, uh, voice over IP. So when you pick up the phone and you're going to call your friend, I'm willing to bet that none of you, when you're doing that, think, oh, I'm going to pick up my phone and I'm going to call 
the telephone switch that houses 270-753-6363 and make a call to the port that is designated 270-753-6363. No, you say, you know, I want to call Sharon. Sorry, I immortalized my wife. <laughs> I want to call a particular person. I don't think about the network. I don't, you know, most people don't even really care. We care because we're geeks living in this industry. But even we don't really care that much, generally, day to day. So when we talk about this, we've got a little bit of a situation here. I can and we have to use this idea to create that voice path. We have to do it. That's the circuit switching and packet switching part. But that's not really what I'm doing. That's a, that's a way of getting at what I want to do, which is to talk to Sharon. Okay? My wife wouldn't let me put her picture up here, so I found some <coughs> willing soul on the Internet. Yeah, you're willing. So, um, in other words, we're going to separate the identity of who we're calling from the telephone number. That's a little tough to do, and the reason is it's hard to do. We still, after a hundred and something years of doing, a hundred and thirty something years of doing this, still haven't figured out a way to do it well. There's some tricks. We'll look at several of them. But what we'd really like to be able to do is say, call John, and wherever John is, that call is delivered. I'll give you an example. In World War II, I'm not that old. My parents lived in uh, for, um, Fort Knox, Kentucky. My grandmother lived here. And mom would occasionally, you know, call home. And generally in those days, if you called long distance, it was, you know, this isn't something important because long distance was expensive. It was about a buck a minute in $1940. Okay, you know, you could buy a brand new car for less than 2500 bucks. <laughs> Actually, you couldn't because they didn't sell cars during World War II. But in that era, you could. So anyway, she called. And the way the telephone networks worked at that point, in our part of the world anyway, is you talk to an operator. Now, in Murray, you had a manual exchange. Our old telephone exchange, believe it or not, is for sale in an antique store south of town. If you want to go buy it, it's 400 bucks. I thought about it. Um, and you would talk to a woman named Clotilde Tucker during the day. Long, the long distance portion of the national network largely was operator driven and was up until the up into the 80s. So what mom did was pick up the phone. I don't remember if they had dials up there or not. It doesn't really matter. But anyway, got to the long distance operator who connected to Murray. And mom saw, you know, heard Clotilde probably passed the time and all that, and then said she wanted to talk to her mother. Okay? Remember, we're trying to get to a particular person, but the way we're doing it is across a particular endpoint, right? The only thing I've changed is that instead of an automatic switch, I have somebody who's going to manually patch a cord in. Okay? Clotilde's answer? I'll ring out there, Elizabeth Ray, but I think I saw your mother going towards a train station, and I believe she was going to see your uncle in Paducah. Small town Murray, I'm sorry. Rang out to the house, nobody was there. Mom hung up and went about her business. About five or ten minutes later, the phone rang, and it was my grandmother at my great uncle's house in Paducah. Clotilde thought it might be important. Now think about what happened. That's a cute story, you know, small town Murray, West Kentucky, all that stuff. Think about what happened. That was a phone call that was delivered independent of network addressing. My mother told the network intelligence, Clotilde. You'll hear more Clotilde stories. They, they actually relate pretty well to what we're trying to do. The network, she told the network intelligence who she wanted to talk to. The network, as constituted that way, could track the identity of who she wanted to talk to separate from the physical network connection. We still can't do that. We can come close. I can do tricks like I call your number 
and it rings at your desk, and if it rings twice, you're, that forwards it somewhere else, and that rings twice, and if that doesn't work, it forwards it somewhere else. Okay, that's sort of the same thing, but not really. That's just serial dialing that's automatic. It's not a network that knows where you are. Everybody says, oh, cell phones. Sort of. It's nice. You know, my cell phone travels with me. But my cell telephone number is tied to a particular phone. I'm 54. Losing a cell phone is not exactly something that is uncommon in my life. <laughs> Never has been, actually. <laughs> I don't keep up with small stuff that well. I've got pocket knives scattered from here to kingdom come. The number on a cell telephone is still associated with a single device. And the assumption is the identity that you want to talk to, the person that you want to talk to, is physically with that phone. And that's still a limitation. Now, I can still play games. You know, I can forward that number on and on and on. Voice over IP comes as close, and I'm not going to go into the way it does it now because it gets pretty intricate comes as close to being able to do this as we've been able to do yet. And it's one of the real advantages of using an IP-based system. But it still can't do what I described. Okay. Um, it can come pretty close. The thing I want you to walk away from this with is we're going to talk about the identity of a user. And we're going to talk about connections to devices, phones, or soft phones on a computer, something that performs the function of a phone. Those two are not the same thing. They're generally very closely associated, and we've done it this way for so long where we have that you are your phone number kind of mindset that we think it's there. It's not. Okay? And you run up smack into it when you start looking at voice over IP because we have a situation, you will walk through programming a switch where you set an identity, you finish that up, then you set up the device. Two separate pieces. Okay? So we'll look at that, but just realize that there's, there are levels to what we're trying to do with voice switching. Voice switching is delivering a call between end users and we typically accomplish that typically <laughs> typically accomplish that by making a connection between endpoints okay we'll visit that idea as we look through this some more now remember we looked at this slide uh, a couple of times remember that our concept of how we do this how we move our voice to whoever we want to select grew out of a circuit switch world. You know, we described an analog network where to make a call from one of those phones to any one of the other phones, I tell the exchange that that phone's connected to where I want to go. The exchange connects the appropriate wire pairs together, and I have a single continuous copper loop. Okay, now, honestly, we outgrew that technology about 1920, but it services this conversation well. If I need to go further away, I just connect more wire pairs. You know, if I need to go over to this other exchange, I'll connect a wire pair up to the toll. I'll connect another wire pair that goes down to this exchange, and then we'll connect another wire pair to that phone. We still end up with one long loop. Okay? As we move through later and later technology, until you get to the packet world, we do this. It gets fancier. It gets a lot more impressive looking. But we do the same thing. We stitch this path together. Okay. How do we control that? He said, getting ready to take out the computer. How do we control that? Well, you've actually been dealing with it a long time. And that is, let me catch my notes up here. We use a network addressing system. You've used its telephone number. And then that's what a telephone number is. It's a network addressing system. It's actually similar to IP. You have a network portion of a telephone number. You have a host portion, if you will. We're going to call them area code, exchange code, 
an end user or extension, but it's the same thing. In fact, the, the telephone number has a little more capability built into it in that it's already multi-networked. Basically, you can think of it as being subnetted. As you move from, if I write a phone number down, as you move from left to right, you get more and more specific to a particular endpoint. Okay, so we're going to dig into that. Before we go that far, we're going to kind of have to learn a little bit about how all this works. And let's talk about what a dial plan. What's a dial plan? It's the addressing plan for a telephone network that uses phone numbers. Okay, we're going to talk about what a dial, a few things a dial plan has to accomplish. First off, now I'm using a PBX as an example. It'd be the same if you were doing a corporate uh, uh, telephone company switch. We mostly place people in enterprise, so I'm going to use PBX. We have to uniquely identify every endpoint on that network. Again, IP. Every host has to have a unique IP address, right? I can't deliver point to point traffic in a network where two hosts share an IP address. It doesn't work. I can NAT, but that's not really the same thing because inside they have their own address. So I'm going to uniquely identify. In this case, I have numbered everything 1001 through 1010. So if I want to die, if I'm sitting at 1006 and I want to talk to you at 1003, I pick up my phone, I dial 1003. That tells the PBX that's the extension I want to talk to. Very straight, simple, straightforward concept. But not all our calls are going to stay inside. Right? A call, what we have to make up is a decision process for this telephone switch. And the decision process is whether or not that call ends at this switch. The term is terminate. Can I terminate this call. Translation, can I deliver it to the end device that it's supposed to go to? In other words, is that end device directly attached to me? If I can't terminate a call, I'm going to try to forward it. Okay? And that's basically what we do. We'll set up a we'll set up a, a, a dial plan that will uniquely identify those phones. We're going to associate particular interfaces <coughs> with those phone numbers. And when a call comes through, I'll look at that list and I'll deliver the call to the interface I need. Again, this is very similar to what you've already done with routing. It's exactly the same idea. It was designed off of this. We're going to have something. If we can't terminate a call, I'm going to have a place to send it. And usually I'm only going to have one place where everything goes. Murray State doesn't keep a list of where every other phone in the universe is. We keep track of our own phones. If it's not here, what do you do in IP if you don't know how to deliver something on the local network? Where do you send it? You send it to the default gateway. And what does a default gateway do? What's its job? It is to forward it, but it, it looks at that number and, try, and tr tries to find the best path to get it to its destination. We're going to do basically the same thing here. Okay. So I'm going to have a connection. If I'm doing an internal call, no problem. I know where both those endpoints are. Here's the call initiating on one point. I'm going to terminate it directly. I don't have to forward it anywhere. I'm going to connect it. If, however, I have a call that's going to somebody out in town on the local exchange carrier, I'm going to take that call, and I'm going to send it to my, quote, default gateway. Now, we don't use that term functions that way. We don't use the term. We're going to use a routing table view of it. You'll see when we get in the lab. Similarly, anything coming into my site from the local exchange carrier, I'm going to accept the digits and then I'm going to make a routing decision based on the to address, the desired number. It's called, uh, it's called the uh, called party, which is a little hard to say. You have calling party and called party. I'm going to look at the called party number and deliver that. We'll look at some more terms of that as we get a little further along. The LEC is doing the same thing. Notice what it's doing with its phones. 
It's uniquely identifying them. And it's making decisions based on interfaces associated with phone numbers. So we're doing the same thing on all these switches. If we're going somewhere further away, the LEC may not know how to get to it. Okay, an IP, what, what does your default gateway do if it doesn't know how to term, you know, deliver a packet? Sends it to its default gateway. And it, you keep doing that until somebody knows what to do with this. PSDN is a little more structured than that, but the flow works the same. Okay. If the LEC doesn't know what to do with a call, it's going to send it up that PSTN stack we looked at earlier. And sooner or later, somebody's going to recognize part of that phone number and start routing it back down. Okay. Again, very much like IP routing. The numbers are different. And the numbers are what give us trouble sometimes. If I don't want a call to go through, I have to block it. Again, think IP. Absent a firewall, if I know how to deliver traffic, I will send that traffic on. Well, I may not want you talking to a particular website from my network. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to put a firewall rule in place and block that traffic. I can do a similar thing with voice paths. I can say 1010 is not allowed to dial long distance, for example, and I'll block it at that port. So we have all of those capabilities you're used to looking at. They look different. They kind of feel different. They do basically the same thing. Oh, by the way, they have different names, which, of course, makes everything hard. OK. So in a simple dial plan, what we're going to do is think about how those decisions happen. So if you look at this network, we have two sites for a company. They have a private connection between them, right here. We're going to say this is two switches on the same private network. This is a private connection between them. So we don't have to go through the PSDN to deliver calls between those two sites. We can use our own stuff. Anything that goes somewhere else, we're going to send to the PSTN. So on the left side, I have three users. And I'm going to say Tom is in room 111. Harry in room 114. Now I can think about this a couple of ways. I can associate phone numbers. Remember, phone numbers are the device part of this. I can make the identity associated with that phone number one of two things the way I've got this set up. I can associate it with the room. So whoever's in that room is who I want to talk to. You know, when you call the hospital or a business, you may, you may know somebody there, but if you just need information, you'll talk to whoever answers the phone. Okay? On the other hand, if I want to talk to somebody specific, I'm going to associate that number with a particular individual. Okay? The reason I use that exact kind of example is you'll see both of these schemes in use in enterprises. Sometimes it's, it's moves, adds, and changes, Max, are a real pain for any kind of network. And for voice networks, they're particularly problematic. If we were using the room kind of thing here, my 6907, which is my office number, would be associated with my, my office, 253, what am I, 253D. If I move out of that office, I change phone numbers. And that's a perfectly legitimate way to do it. There's no, nothing wrong with designing it that way. Just realize that's what you're doing. Similarly, and this is what the university does for the most part, if I associate a particular phone number with a particular user, then I let that phone number move physically as the user moves. So if I move from 253D to 253Y, I'm going to take my phone and we're going to update the database or do whatever we need to do so that my calls are delivered to that new location. Yeah, yeah. It's actually a fairly recent thing you've been able to do. You used to not even be able to move across the same town and let your number follow you. 
now it's no big deal. But the point, the point I want to make here is neither one of these is right or wrong. They're just different ways of looking at it. Okay. And when we start doing this in the lab, what you're going to see is you have the flexibility to set it up that way. With three users in three rooms, or six users in six rooms, if you look at both sites, this is no big deal. I can do this on the back of a napkin. Okay, try managing 30,000 users around the world in 20 locations. Now I've got a problem. Record keeping is a big deal here, and we're going to look at how record keeping works. Okay? So anyway, what, look at the decision process that goes on here. How are we doing? Okay. If I want to call from 1101 to 1201, I pick up the phone, I dial the number, the PBX gets those numbers. Right now it happens by magic. We'll talk about how the technology works later. PBX looks at the fact that I want to get to 1201, and it asks the question, can I terminate this call? Can it? No. That, the phone associated with 1201 is not directly connected to the same PBX as the one associated with uh, 1101. So that PBX is going to make a routing decision to send it to another switch. Now, basically, it has a table that says, for these numbers, send them here. That's where we're leading up to. So it'll send it across this private trunk connection to this switch. Okay, this switch receives 1201 and asks, can I terminate the call? Yeah, I can. Okay, That's a very simple example. I could stretch this out to 20 switches, and the process is still the same. Each switch looks at it and says, here's where this call is going. Can I terminate it? Yes or no. If no, where do I need to send it? Okay. Here is what we're going to spend the next probably at least a week on. So this, this takes a little, a little getting used to. When you talk about dial plan and numbers, where it's different from IP is there we're not, we're looking at the digits as a pattern, not as a number. The way we deal with these is going to look like a math class. We are not doing math. We are not adding and subtracting. It's going to look like it, but we're not. Okay. What we're doing is defining a pattern, and we are associating it with a particular port. It, remember the little kid's story? As a cube had different cutouts on each face, you know, and you had to learn to put the star in the star hole and all that. You know, management took the square peg, put it in the round hole, and stepped on it. And, you know, was kind of. The, that's basically what we're doing, except that you have to think about being inside the box, pushing these things out. That's what a dial plan does. Okay? Actually, the process it does it is called switchboard, back to the old days when there was an operator. So the switchboard process looks at your dial plan entries and makes decisions about which hole, <laughs> which interface, we have to send a call through. So, for example, if I put 2304 up there, and I'm as bad as anybody, I'll call it, you know, 2304, 2304, or something like that. That's fine for referencing it, but realize the way we look at it has nothing to do with the numeric value of this. These are, this is a shape, <laughs> and the shape is 2304. The way we look at this is, What's in the first digit place? What's in the second digit place? What's in the third digit place? Fourth digit place? The number of digits will vary depending on how many phones you've got to address. If I have fewer than 10 and I don't think they're going to grow, I'll use two digits or even one. If I have 50 phones and it's not going to grow past 100, I could still use two digits. I probably would use three. We'll leave a little bit there. So we can size this to match what we want to do. But what I'm going to do is use that pattern to route those calls. I'm going to associate particular patterns with particular ports. And here, you, here is how you interpret them. These are common. Almost every device you'll see supports these. Some devices can add to this. You may get a few more ways of doing things. 
any digit that's actually written out as a digit is itself. Two always matches two. It doesn't match three. Okay? X is any single digit, and it can have a value of zero or one or two or three, so on and so forth, up to nine. So a single digit, any single value, zero through nine. Okay? N is a single digit, one digit place, but it's any value two through nine. Why would I not include zero or one? Yeah, on the PSTN, on the PSTN, zero and one are reserved functions, and so an awful lot of times you can't use them. On a private network, why would we do it? Because we still have to talk to the PSTN, and you can get in all manner of confusing trouble in a hurry <laughs> if you start prefacing things with zero and one when you send them out. So n is just a shortcut for saying two through nine. The next one is. Fairly common, but it's a rule that's made to be broken. Our equipment does both of these. What do I mean by both? If you're looking at the older version of the switches we have in here, the, the uh, voice switches that we'll look at late in the semester, you can list a range of digits by you listing each individual one. So I would say bracket 1, 2, 3, and that single digit place can have the value of either 1 or 2 or 3, not 4, 5, 6, or 7. I just list the values. You have to use the commas. Later versions, you can use 1-3, for example, meaning 1 through 3. You have to know what your equipment does. There's no hard, fast rule to it. Typically, smarter equipment can do things like dash. OK, Z or M, again, some of our systems use it. Some of them don't. Will be any single digit one through nine, so we we delete zero, zero even on private networks is typically reserved for the operator. Dollar sign is a little special. We'll see why we need it later, but for now, remember that dollar sign is any number of any digits. So dollar sign matches one. Dollar sign matches 270753 Dollar sign matches 16 digits in a row of your choice. Dollar sign matches anything. Why do we need something that matches anything? Because a very general match is not the same. Matching anything is not the same thing as matching nothing from a routing point of view. I have to have a way to match anything separate from not having a match. Okay, don't have a match, I'm going to do one thing. If I have a match, even if it's very general, I'm going to do something else. Okay. So tell me what this means. What's the range of numbers we're talking about here? What's the lowest combination of that? Okay, three, four. What's this? What's the third digit place statement mean? Either one or two. No other possible value. So three, four, one would be the lowest possible value. There's a reason I'm saying it that way. What's the fourth digit place? Okay, zero for the lowest. What what does what does that expression mean? Any single value zero through nine in the lowest combination is zero. Okay. Is it just the first digit place where the zero one is being reserved? That depends on your dial plan. That's usually the case. Yes. Not always. It depends on what you're trying to accomplish. Okay. Tell me the highest combination of these. What are the first two digits always going to be? Three four. How do I know they're always going to be three four? Because I've specified three four. And Three only matches three, and four only matches four. Okay, what's the highest combination of one two? Okay, what's the highest value possible in X? Okay, here's where it starts looking like a math problem. We're going to do a range of numbers that is three four one zero through 
three, four, two, nine. So with one simple routing entry, I can associate 20 telephone numbers with a single port, fairly specifically. Begin to see how we can use this to make some pretty subtle routing decisions? Yeah, I can take, I can take 341X and route it one way, and 342X and route it another way, for example. So we're going to play those kind of games. You've got to have pretty good facility with this, so we're going to practice this for a good bit. Okay, the, uh, the pieces that you end up seeing changing as you work through this. I've already mentioned number of digits. How many endpoints do I have to address? How are they divided? That'll determine how many digits I use and give me a start on patterns, what groups of patterns I want to do. Now, the other thing we get into is do you have to use public telephone numbers? Five years ago, I didn't even bring this up because everybody used public telephone numbers. Not so much the case anymore. I can think of at least three places that have completely private phone systems and route everything off site by name, not by number. And so they can design a completely private dial plan. So all the phones at this site are going to be 1,000. All the phones at this site are going to be 2,000. All of them here are going to be 3,000. And I just number them however I want. More commonly, you're going to get what are called public phone numbers. They're just exactly like public IPs. They're routable on, you know, public IPs are routable on the public internet. Public phone numbers are routable by the PSTN. So I can specify the public phone number assigned to you, and it's going to go across the PSTN and perform exactly like you want it to. Private numbers will not. You have to translate them to a public number. Is this feeling like IP routing? It's real similar. <laughs> You're, you, you're going to be comfortable once you realize what terms go with which. I'll give you a couple more. He was designed looking at it. It wasn't designed to exactly replicate this. So there are differences. Okay? For one thing, I can have lots of network addresses that are purely network addresses. It's not just subnetting. Okay? Subnetting doesn't exactly apply. Okay? Um, the other thing that is different about this, there is one place that assign or that is responsible for assigning all of the numbers in our part of the world. It's called the North American Number Plan Administration. It's actually run by it's still Blue Star, isn't it? Do you know? I think Blue Star, I think, still runs it. Anyway, it's run under contract. Um, we actually have kind of an interesting thing going on for this class this semester. We're adding an area code on top of what we're doing here. As we go through this, we're going to talk about why that was there and what the options were and let you kind of see what all the brouhaha is about as we go through it. Okay. So wrapping up for this, we have to, for voice switching, we have to remember that it's more than just building the physical path. What we're actually doing is connecting end users. Most of the time, we accomplish that by assuming the end user is going to be physically with the device we're calling. But increasingly, and particularly with IP, we may be able to get around that. Okay. Number two, as we do this sort of thing, we have to address we have to somehow specify an endpoint. That's where network addressing comes in. In this world, network addressing is called dial planning. It's just a different term for the same concept. I'm going to uniquely identify individual endpoints. I'm going to identify endpoints in a group that I can talk about, treat similarly, like all the phones at one site. We're going to learn the nomenclature and the patterns and rules 
for doing that. Okay. And believe it or not, the rules on this, and we'll dig into this a little more next time, the rules on this are actually pretty simple. They're only, depend, kind of depends on how you want to count them, but really they're about five or six rules that control every call you've ever made. You can combine them in intricate ways, but the rules themselves are pretty simple. So this stuff, when we start this, is confusing. Partially it's confusing because you're going to want to try to apply IP rules to it. IP works as an analogy. The rules don't do the same thing. So we're going to spend a fair amount of time. Don't get discouraged the first few times you go through it. It's, it's a new thing. Some of you are going to pick it up real quickly. Some of you it's going to be hard for. It's just a way of, it's a way of looking at the patterns we're doing, okay? You'll all get it, I promise you. It's just sometimes a little bit of a road to get there. Okay? See ya.